Today, it gives me enormous pleasure to interview Sarah Heller, who is a master of wine. But I think she's so much more than that. That's one of her titles. But you'll discover very soon who and what Sarah Heller is and what I see as enormous potential for the years ahead. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for that glowing introduction. I really appreciate it. Sarah, if one were to ask you what possible grape varietals there are in an Amarone, I don't think you would have any problem in rattling off the names Corvina, Rondonella, Coravain, and a few other permitted varieties. Now, if Sarah Heller was a prestigious wine, and I'm sure she is, and you were asked, what is your makeup? What is your soul? What is your background, your roots? Could you share well, more with viewers? Yeah, I mean, I think it would have to be a great variety that um, that has traveled a great deal of distance and probably doesn't really know entirely where it is at home and, and manages to do well, I hope, in, in a couple of different environments. It's, okay. it's ironic because when you first asked the question, I was thinking to myself, Nebbiolo, but if, if it has to be something that's really like me, Nebbiolo is one yeah. that's so at home in Piemonte and really doesn't thrive anywhere else. So I think that would be not not the ideal choice, perhaps. Um, I don't know, I like, maybe a bit more like you. Syrah. Tell us about you, <laughs> Where, your background. Thank you. Yeah, so I, um, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, um, but as you can see, I'm not there at the moment. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm, um, so I moved... Um, in the early part of last year to the Pacific Northwest, um, which is actually where my dad grew up. So my dad is half Hong Kong Chinese and half German, Irish, different things. Um, yeah. But he, yeah, he grew up in the Pacific Northwest, um, which even then was already a very international community. And um, near, near, well, he grew up in Seattle. We're near Seattle now. And um, when my husband and I, we, we, we kind of, we felt that it was time to, to move somewhere else, partly for our kids. Um, we wanted our kids to have a little bit more, I think the same reasons that a lot of people have for leaving, leaving Hong Kong, we just wanted them to have a little bit more space. Um, and so as we were looking at that, we had a lot of choices because he's from New Zealand. Um, he had the right to be in Australia. Um, we could have ended up in Europe somewhere, but um, we liked that the Pacific Northwest still has a bit of a connection to Asia, mm -hmm. um, but it's but it's in the U.S., which is I um, I'm actually American, even though I was born overseas. So it, it's um, yeah, it's been an ambition for some time to to make moves into this market as well. So so you are in 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 many senses of the word um, a hybrid. You've got some, indeed, you know, mm -hmm. and and with that comes the linguistic skills. Thank you. you well, languages. I I love languages. I didn't know that when I was a kid growing up. I I actually, ironically, despite having been born in Hong Kong, um, I grew up with English and German because my dad is part German. I went to the German Swiss school, and mm -hmm. um, so that was always very confusing uh, for people, <laughs> people especially you know taxi drivers, other people, because I look Cantonese enough, um, and. Uh, I would always respond in, in very broken Cantonese, if at all. Um, but with time, um, when I was in school, later on, I learned Mandarin. And then when I was in university, I decided that I wanted to spend more time in Europe. And so I, I'd always had um, the idea that I would like to speak a lot of European languages, but didn't really think it was feasible to just pick them up. But um, I found Rosetta Stone, um just show, showing my age a little bit there was no duolingo yet but um and yeah spent the summer one year learning french the next time learning italian and um and yeah then obviously being immersed in the cultures uh, is very helpful for for really getting um in depth on the language skills i don't think it's uh, revealing your your age i'm also a rosetta stone fan and disciple fantastic yeah fantastic. So, um I know exactly what you're talking about. Now, you're located just north or south of Seattle? Um, actually, just east. So we're on an island. Um, I'm not there right now. We're actually in the mountains. But I'm on an island in the middle of Lake Washington. Okay. Well, that's, um, that's quite a journey that you've taken, Sarah. Now, 
I, I see you as a sort of new wave, the changing of the guard. And with it, there has to be changes themselves. Could you share with us some of your reviews of wine, for example, with the Tatler Champagne Asian Guide that you've just completed, please? Thank you. Thank you. So the the idea, I mean, I think wine, wine criticism, right, has been, I think, um, more widely accepted on an international scale in the wake of Robert Park, right? He, it's kind of, he's led the way in terms of what people think a wine review is supposed to be. 100 points. Obviously, there are other critics, especially in the UK, like Jancis, who use 20 points. But I think for, for a lot of consumers, both in the Asian market and the American market, especially, hundred points is it. And I, I actually have gone down that path at this point with uh, Clubino Logique, um, but with Tatler, which was really um, the champagne guide that we created, was really something new from my tenure there. And I wanted to do something that was less about telling people with a sort of somewhat objective number, like this is great, this is not great. I wanted to give people an idea of what the styles were like. I think to highlight the fact that there is so much more stylistic diversity in Champagne now than there was, and there's always been more than people realize that there was. So um, what I did was we started using um, these shapes to describe, shapes and colors to describe the wines. So um, the, the shape that I've come up with that I think is a little bit, a little bit confusing for people to understand, but um, I'm keeping pressing ahead with it is the idea of a lens, right? So a wine that's sort of tight to begin with, fills out on the middle and then is sharp again to finish. I think so many champagnes have that shape. Um, but the ones that have more Pinot Noir, for example, tend to have wider shoulders. So I think of those more like a rectangle. Pinot Meunier, maybe more oval shaped, but a classic Chardonnay driven um, champagne, I think of the classic lens shape. And then we talked about the colors, not so much in terms of the color of the wine, but the color spectrum of the flavors, right? Are these more golden flavors? Are they greener flavors? Um, is there even like a bit of pink in the flavor? So that, that, that was sort of the idea with that. You know, as you were describing, you know, the broadness and then the, the, the concentration and the focus, I, I could envisage that very, very clearly. And, you. you know, I think there is a time and there is a place for uh, people like um, uh, Robert Parker, uh, James Suckling, they, they all have their niche, but there's a new wave. There's a new descriptor that people want. I think the, as you mentioned, out of the hundred points, it becomes quite boring, actually. And there's the sense that, oh, if it's not a 90 pointer plus, then it's not worthwhile looking at. Now, I, I'm of the opinion that the best wine that people can try is actually the wine that they like. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't Absolutely. matter what anybody else says. You could pound them with the best French or Italian cruise, and it would make no difference at all. Now, what interests me is part of your studies on the, um, you had to write a paper for your MW, and uh, it was on um, the new generation and what they looked for with e-commerce. Could you share that with us a bit more? Absolutely, and thank you for, for looking into that. It's it's one I talked about a lot when I first got the MW and then it hasn't come up for a while, so I'm excited to have the opportunity. Um, that was actually, in a way, the font of a lot of my insights, I think, into the way that younger people are thinking about wine, particularly in China, where it is, it's still a, a new wine market. Um, was that people want to be given descriptors that are evocative rather than descriptive per se, right? So they don't, telling somebody this wine tastes like strawberries and raspberries, especially, I mean, I think this has come up any number of times talking about the Asian wine market, but those are such specific descriptors, right? To, to places, right? And we, and I think the opening up of China really drove that point home that having a descriptor that uses a fruit that's not available in a different market is actually then deeply unhelpful and alienating, right? It makes people feel yeah. even more distant yeah. From, yeah. from the culture of wine. So the words, for a while, the idea had been maybe we use um, local descriptors like Hawthorne or, or um, Goji Berry or things like that. And that, that has a place too, I think. 
But the study that I did, which was a discrete choice experiment where people got to choose between different bundles, it was basically a product page, right? It would say this wine, I don't know, has a community rating of X. It has the um, price. It has this origin and it has um, these descriptors. And the options that we had, we had two different um, Chinese uh, fruit descriptors, two different Western fruit descriptors. One that was, I think, generic was just like red fruit and one that used, or maybe two, that used um, evocative descriptors. So like mellow and rounded or fresh and fruity, things like that. Things that leave, um, that, that make you feel something but leave a lot of room for interpretation. And those were the ones that by far, I think had the most appeal um, to consumers. And that was something I had heard anecdotally before, but to have it really um, suggested strongly by my data was, um, was really reassuring. And actually that's what led into the, the glassware range that I designed um, shortly after that, that was really about highlighting those features in wine, right? Because okay. people, people were strongly drawn to either fresh and fruity or rounded and mellow, right? And that, that I think almost was something they identified themselves with. Um, so. so are you sort of making the shape of the glasses an extension of what you read and what you saw and what you felt as the response to the survey? Exactly, so I mean, I think, Wine glasses, right? We've known we've known for a long time that the wine glass that you serve the wine in has a huge impact on the way that it tastes and smells and everything. Mm-hmm. I think Riedel have led the way in terms of making people aware of those differences. The place where I think I diverge a little bit with with Riedel's approach is that they they're very much about saying this is the perfect glass for Zinfandel. This is the perfect glass for Sangiovese. Right? And I think not only in an Asian context where a lot of us live in cities where you just do not have that kind of storage, I thought was impractical. But also I think um, implies that there is one way to enjoy. It comes back to what you were saying before, that there is one way to enjoy any particular grape variety, which I just do not think is true. I think it's so much more important that what you drink is giving you the experience that you want, right? You paid the money for the wine, you should get what you want out of it. Um, Absolutely. And so the glasses are designed to shape the experience to your preferences. Right? So um, the rubric that, or the the um, the thought, rule of thumb that we used, I guess, was the um, the idea of the elements, right? Because that is such a sort of Eastern but also Western concept, right? We have an ancient Greek philosophy that had this idea of the natural elements. We have Ayurveda. We have in traditional Chinese medicine, which by extension is in Korean medicine and. Um, this idea of the elements. Obviously, everybody has different ideas of what those elements are and what they signify. So there's a little bit of um, little bit of wiggle, wiggle room in there. But basically, well, they, yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah, they, they did the use idea. that during the medieval times as well. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. Yeah, for human and, health. And what they would eat. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and it just it felt like a very natural way of thinking about wine and wine enjoyment. So much so that I was really surprised that nobody had used it before. Um, at least at that point when we looked into it. But um, so, yeah, we have five glasses in the range. Um, each one is named after a natural element. So um, air, earth, um, air, earth, water, fire, and gold, which is the one for sweet wine. Oh, not wine. wind. Okay. No, exactly. Because there are different ones. There's ether. There's like, there are, yeah, different, different okay. ones, depending on which you look at. At least uh, 80% on the sort of Asian type of thinking. But... Mm-hmm. For the scholars, if you go back to the medieval times, the Western uh, sense of medicine was based on what you eat is is, is medicinal. So very much uh, in line with with Asian thought at that time. Mm-hmm. So Sarah, you know, I want to move on now to the millennial generation, the wine drinkers in Hong Kong, and I know you've had extensive experience there. You were born there. You grew up there. You worked with Deborah Myberg, um, a friend of mine as well. And here's the question. Are they still focused on just the big brands and they're wanting to show their status? Or have they diversified from what I think are self-imposed limitations? Yeah, you know, I think 
I, I should caveat this, that the, pe the people I'm hanging out with are interested in wine, right? So it's uh, perhaps a slightly skewed view. But having said that, I do think there is a much broader group of millennials who've developed an interest in wine within the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I think when, um, when the tax first came off wine, so more like 15 years ago, um, it was really about people who were already collecting or there was the sort of gold rush element, right? And it was about investing and making a huge amount of money, money off of class growth Bordeaux and, and sort of speculative market. And I think that was not something in which millennials who at the time had just graduated from college, a lot of us really had had that much ability yeah. to play in. I knew, I knew some people who are working in finance who were maybe you know doing the buy one, sell one strategy um, with their wine, but it was still, that was still an era that was very much tied to big brands because it was about investment, right? Which inherently is more suited to the big brands. Now, I think the way that people derive their status about wine is really about being an insider, right? So it's like, oh, I found out about this new grower champagne. Um, there's a level of geekiness that I think is delightful and, and happened. I saw happen in a lot of different markets, um, you know, as, um, involved with the New York market while I was at university, I okay. interned at, a, at an importer in, in New York. Um, and then the UK market while I was studying the MW, I was in London a lot. Um, I think there wasn't that same level of confidence that people had where they, they felt like they could be that person to introduce a new brand um, to their friends. And now if, if anything, the, it's switched, right? And people really feel like if they're not out there discovering new things, they're um, they're kind of falling behind. They're not real real wine enthusiasts. So um, that that manifests in different ways. Right? I talked about grower champagne, but then there's also there's also the Burgundy thing, right? Burgundy has gotten so expensive now that I think if you're just buying the big brands, you look like you don't know what you're doing, right? You you don't know how to find a deal. So there is that that desire to say, oh, this guy I know, he used to mm. work for. You know, he used to work for Jeremy Sesa du Jacques, right? And now he's starting his own demand. That that's sort of the where the credibility comes from. As well as another angle of that, I think, would be natural wine, which is more affordable, but definitely it's that cr the crowd that would have been drinking craft beer maybe five, right. ten years ago. They're they've very much embraced uh, natural wine. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to this because um, I think that the market if we even said six, seven years ago, um, mm -hmm. prior to the, let's say, the bump in the road with the Australian wine uh, issue, um, China was a huge uh, growing market, which has now significantly declined. But let me get back mm -hmm. to that. I think what's more important, how do you manage um, to balance your life? You've got a husband you know you've got children and it, it requires an enormous amount of time and dedication to a family and yet your work um requirements are, are also equally as demanding i i think the viewers would love to hear how you do it thank you um that's a very good question <laughs> um you know in fact i had my son the same year that i passed the master of wine so in effect, this whole phase of my career has been um, very much a balancing act and trying to figure out how how all of the pieces fit together. Um, I have sort of recurring nightmares about the last month that I was trying to turn in my uh, my research paper. Um, my son had just been born. I was still feeding him, obviously. He was a month old. And um, then I got an email about a month before it, the research paper was due saying, do, are you sure that all the statistics in this paper work the way that you think they do for my advisor? And I dug into it a little bit and realized that he was absolutely right. There were, there were all kinds of issues with the statistics. Okay. I'm not a statistician, but um, it was apparent to me even. So it was just a month of panicked rewriting and trying, you know, the conclusions had to be changed and everything. And my poor husband was there desperately trying to keep this little baby who needed to be fed every hour or so, you know, from, from losing his mind. So, um, and it's kind of been like that ever since. My husband is incredibly supportive. Um, well, has you look remarkably been. calm, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Sarah. And, and I think that must be part of the artistic flair that you have. 
So moving on to that, you know, just listening to the way you describe the, the type of work that you've done with the glassware and uh, your painting, share with us about your paintings, because that's quite uh, uh, a, an extraordinary horizon that you sort of pair up to share with us. Thank you. So I actually, I, I was studying, I was studying painting at university when I took time mm -hmm. off and sort of went off on this, this uh, wine direction. Um, obviously that then thankfully got, got my degree in the end, um, or my parents would be much less happy with me than they are today. But um, as a result, I, I had, I had this idea that I would be able to um, use wine sort of as my day job um, and have my paintings still going on in the background. Um, but that was very much predicated on my staying in the New York, New York area where I was for university or the Tri-State area anyway. Um, and then um, at, between university, or right after I graduated, I had an accident working at a winery. Um, so I fell into you broke, a, you broke a your concrete spine. vat. Yes, I fell into a vat, broke my spine. Um, and I... Was kind of at least ends. I needed. I needed. I knew I needed to go back home to Hong Kong to recover. Um, but I, the Hong Kong art market at that point was very much not aligned with the kind of work that I was making at the time. I was doing a lot of performance art and installation. It was very non-commercial, and there were just. I, I had a couple of meetings at galleries where people would just look at me blankly and say, "Well, what? What, what are we going to sell? <laughs> what are we going to sell from this?" Um, but um, I kind of kept it as an interest in the background. I wasn't making art, but I was still you know, reading about it, trying to keep up. And after I got the Master of Wine, I thought to myself, okay, I, I have all of these various projects that I've signed up to do, kind of from people approaching me, frankly. It was, it was very, very fortunate timing. There was a lot of enthusiasm around wine in Hong Kong. And um, I think around my being the first Hong Kong born person. I think there was, mm -hmm. there was a wonderful like groundswelling of pride, which I just am, am immensely grateful for. Um, but I thought I want something that's just me, right? That I've, I've just decided to do on my own and it won't be big or commercial. It's not gonna be something that I spend a huge amount of time or investment on, but it will be mine. And so I started making these little um, digital collages that were my visual interpretation of my experiences tasting different wines. And they were very quick and easy to begin with and very sort of shorthand almost. I was posting them on Instagram um, and people really responded to them. I think because of, because of a sense of dis dissatisfaction with wine reviewing, just to come back to a topic oh, yeah. we were discussing cool. earlier, um, that people want something more, more evocative, more um, emotion driven, more subjective actually to latch on to. <laughs> more stimulating thank you. Thank you. i wasn't gonna say it, but you thank you <laughs> thank you um and uh yeah so i i built that up and and gradually i was approached by various people wanting to wanting to collaborate looking looking for different ways that mm -hmm. um we could um sort of make something more out of the project and I really, probably the, the, the thing that took me to the next step or permitted me to spend more time on it was um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, I was introduced to a man, uh, Raimondo Rom Romani, of um, Ro Gelazzini Romani, who has uh, an Italian uh, wine auction house. And he was doing a wine auction to raise money for, well, sorry, I, I wanted to create the um, pieces to raise money for um, the Italian Red Cross at the mm -hmm. time. And so we agreed to do a collaboration where he would put together um, ideal provenance lots, right? So sourced directly from the wineries and I would create images um, based on those. There were digital paintings. We created limited edition prints um, and we sold them as a bundle. Um, so that, you know, so it sort of brought me to the attention of a number of um, major wine producers in Italy, Biondi Santi, um, Aldo Conterno, um, Sassicaia. I mean, so we had just a, an incredible array of wines for that event. So talking and... about that, you, you <laughs> now have encapsulated your art, your wine, your motherhood, the wife, everything together. 
quite fascinating. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Remarkable. Now, I, I, I want to move on here, Sarah, because I want to use that as a foundation. You were interviewed by Tatler, and you stated you're definitely not the mold that many see as a master of wine. Much older, typically male, Caucasian, if I may add. Do you feel the Chinese have a word for it, yin fun, right? Okay, sort of fate, destiny. Do you feel that fate may have given you this platform to ignite change in the wine world? And what's the reason for your answer? Um, I I would love to take credit for being a, a, vo a voice for change in the wine industry. Um, and, sometimes, you know, I really... sometimes it's thrust upon you unknowingly. <laughs> Thank you. I really, I do... I do try to be supportive of other women in the wine industry. I know there's a there's a sense in a lot of industries that the women who do get to the top then pull the ladder up behind them right, and don't do their part to support others. And I think the reason why I, um, I think I was reasonably confident I would not be one of one of fit, fitting that stereotype is that I was brought, you know, I was raised up by the women who came before me. As you mentioned before, I worked with Devin Myberg, um, who was one of the first masters of wine in Asia. And in fact, all of our masters of wine in Asia at that point were women. A, a, a woman. Yeah, and, um, and she was incredibly supportive, always has been of other women as well. And, um, and so there was always a sense, you know, if you, if you do get ahead, you need to help bring others along with you. But that's, that's a critical part of it. I think there's there's a fear among a lot of people like that their specialness comes from being the only one, right? And that that would be eroded. There's, somehow, there's a difference, how. Sarah. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. You have Asian blood in you and you are looked at in a totally different perspective with all due respect to the other MWs, that lady MWs in Asia. That's got to give you that edge. Well, so... Um, I mean, I, as, as I mentioned before, I, I definitely got um, a lot of support, I think from the Hong Kong community, especially mm -hmm. from having been raised in Hong Kong and sort of made in Hong Kong, which is, which is something that has, it has inspired, inspired a lot of, a lot of pride, um, certainly yeah. in Hong Kong. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think I, um, I see myself maybe as a little bit more emblematic of where the market is rather than that I was the one pushing for change. You know, in in Hong Kong, in Asia, there have been a lot of female professionals in the wine industry, um, I think proportionate to in other countries. And partly that is because it is a newer market, right? So what we were mentioning about the MW before, the reason why there are so many older men and white, as it were, <laughs> obviously, um, is because it was it was an English institution, right? It was started in the 1950s. It was started for English merchants. Those were kind of the only people who oh. were in that position, right? And and so actually, if you look at the student population now, it's very have it's very even. If anything, skewed a little bit towards women. Um, there is okay. among the younger generations, I think, a less less of a sense that um, they're not welcome at the table. Now, that's, that's very different in different areas of the market. I'd say in unfortunately there's there are some kind of stereotypical divisions that remain right there are a lot more women in marketing than there are in sales for instance um there are, are still if you looked at winemaking right there's still heavy heavy imbalance towards male male winemakers sommelier um there's there are reasons for that right like winemaking is very physical right and i'm, I'm not saying that women that women can't handle that but we're socialized generally to think that men are the ones who do the heavy lifting, right? And women, yeah. But I I've think... Made a, I've, made a, I've been through a lot of harvests with women and and, mm -hmm. and they really uh, are able to uh, pull their weight as well. But honestly, it is back-breaking work and, and um, it can be quite savagely painful, you know, the next day, you know, when you sort of yeah. get... Yeah. So, Absolutely. Talking about that, Sarah, you know, part of the profession, moving on to the bottle, the final product, part of the professional mm -hmm. services you offer include wine consulting. Now, 
Given your location in Hong Kong and the plummeting wine imports into China, and, and as a result, what sort of advice would you offer a potential wine exporter to this market, say between the next three to five year window? Uh, so a winery wanting to export their wine to Hong Kong or China? I, I would say, yeah, it's two different markets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was that was a point I was going to make. You know, yeah, Hong Kong is is so small and premium, right? It's just it's really focused on collectible wine and ultra premium wine. And I think there was a big disappointment among um, producers at the very beginning of you know two thousand eight to, to say two thousand ten or eleven, before there was the real crackdown mm -hmm. right, on the mainland market. There was this real idea that Hong Kong was going to become a huge market and it affected everybody, both the, the top end, but also mass market producers who thought they could be selling containers of their wine into the supermarkets in Hong Kong. And that simply was never the case. Um, you know, the Hong Kong population, um, the people who drink, the population that drinks is this tiny sliver and they drink very heavily, right? So if you look at the per capita consumption at one point, it was like five liters per capita. Yeah. But I would say that was probably like a hundred liters for the people who were drinking a lot and then virtually yeah. nothing for everyone else. Um, whereas China's, China certainly has that, but I think it's, it's different. And there are areas where you could sell more volume. The challenge having worked um, in the sort of volume space in the Chinese market is there's, it's just a huge amount that's, in the market, as you mentioned, um, imports uh, plummeted, and and there's just there's a lot of stock sitting on shelves. Um, so it's it's a really challenging time to think about entering the market. If I were going to do it, I would exclusively look at working with somebody who has um, relationships with um, with a sustainable market that's not built around gifting, that's not built around specific events, but that's maybe driven by food and beverage, like wine bistros become a mm -hmm. new sort of um, consumption location, right? A, for um, a lot of uh, younger people, especially that I think was not the case 10 years ago. Um, and so, yeah, I would be looking to work in that kind of upper end of mid-market range where there is a real customer. It's not about stockpiling and hoping that you're going to make a big sale at some point. So right now it's still rather nebulous in an unchanged in a changing environment that doesn't offer much stability um, from the sounds of it. And, and I think it's not only applicable to wine, but but to many other industries Absolutely. certainly around on a, on a global scale. Now, mm -hmm. Sarah, you've scaled the summits of many distinct aspects of life, from art to wine, education. Where to next? Oh, thank you. I mean, I think for me, it's about continuing with with what with what I've I've started. I um I think the first few years of being a master of wine was there were so many diverse opportunities, and my husband has been saying to for, for to me for years, you need to narrow, you need to focus, right? You need to just double down on the things that you're doing. So, mm -hmm. um, I you know Italy has been my area of focus sort of from the beginning of my career, actually before I got into wine, I spent time in Italy working as a cook at a restaurant. So um, that was quite spending more time in Italy. Yeah, yeah, I was listening to <laughs> the other interviews, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. It was a, it was a very eye-opening time and, and wonderful. And just, I've never, I've never quite gotten over my love of the country. And the Italians are remarkable people. I mean, you know, they're the descendants of the... Uh, you know, the Roman Empire, I mean, a, a thousand year empire, remarkable, so many things that they've done, whether it's in yeah. fashion, cars, wine, it's just life, a dolce vita, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's the things, the things that keep me coming back to um, Italy are the same things that keep people coming back to wine, but just more of them, right? There's more history, there are more great varieties, there's more, there's more different cuisines, right? It's just, it's so incredibly rich that I don't feel like by limiting myself to Italy, I'm limiting myself at all. Right? So it's um, that's that's been wonderful being able to to spend more time, invest more time in in one region. Right? So you're you're now in um, 
in, in, in northwest of the US on an mm -hmm. island just east of Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, do you see yourself traveling much? So I do, I do travel a lot actually too, um, which no. is, yes, yeah, which is one of the challenges for, um, for my husband, for my kids. Um, I've been very lucky in that my family who live in Hong Kong most of the time have managed to come here for several months at a time. And so they hold down the fort while I'm able to go to Europe. So last year I was maybe eight weeks in Italy. Um, this year I'll be in Italy a bunch, but actually we're also, we're, we're planning to try to do some family travel in Italy as well. My son is Beautiful. so excited. Beautiful. <laughs> so excited. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's certainly a puzzle. I mean, I, I, I think the challenge for me is that because I'm not working so much in this market at the moment, the way that I was in Hong Kong where I was doing no. events and I was writing for lo local publication. Um, it is, it is certainly more, more to juggle, but the flip side of that is that when I am here, it's like being on a retreat and it's really been very helpful for, for both writing and painting. Awesome. Painting was really challenging when I was in Hong Kong, partly because of space, but also just there are three events every day that you could and maybe should be going to. And that's very much a different, different scenario here. So one of the things that, uh, you know, my, my book on etiquette was uh, launched last year. So it's called Master the Art mm. of Manners. And uh, in the book, I mention, because, um, you know, wine, good food, you know, convivial company, it's all part of the etiquette um, fabric. Absolutely. And you mentioned, I think, it was with uh, bestwine.com or one of the interviews. One of the things that you found perhaps quite irritating was when you were with your husband, that always the Somalia would automatically tend to at least go to your husband first to ask them about the wine what's your advice mm. to 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 woman in that case i think to be light-hearted about it there really yeah. is no no point in getting into a a tense confrontation yeah. with people i think ever if, if it can be avoided um but just playfully i i try to take the the list from him and say it's my turn today or something like that so that the person who did it isn't embarrassed, but they, they should get the message. The one that, that irritates me is when it's the same person, brings him the list, I take it, I order, they check with him. Then when they bring the bottle, they show him the bottle and pour it to him. Now I wanna give people the benefit of the doubt and say it's just, you know, they're, they're just rushed. They're serving a lot of tables. They forgot, right, that I was the one who ordered it. But at a certain point, you start taking it personally. <laughs> <laughs> we're all but human I, we're all human yeah 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 um but i don't know i think always always to try to avoid thinking that it's a personal attack and think of course, well, the person's of course. just I, I don't think anybody wants to go there and, and having that aggravation at the beginning of a meal certainly doesn't uh uh give a good sense and it's not a good start for an evening you know to have no. that of course now my last question, Sarah, for this interview, and thank you very much. You've been such a wonderful guest. When one mentions Michelangelo, you only need to think of many, but certainly the Sistine Chapel. Hugh Johnson, you think of his series, The History of Wine, and his wine reports. So I know you're at the beginning, but say at the end of your career, and say five decades hence, how would you like to be remembered? Wow. I, I love the question. It's good to have ambition, right? <laughs> uh, I, the area that I think um, I'm doing something a little bit different, right? And that could, could become Absolutely. a mark that I'd like to leave on the world is around ele elevating, elevating the way that we think about wine to, um, beyond being sort of a consumable, like a, just a, a beverage, right? M moving it on to being something that is worthy of contemplation, right? Along the lines of art. I think there's a little bit of, um, 
it's a little bit boring the idea of saying you know everything everything is art at, it, in a way that like kind of kind of like but the that is boy. true though it is art <laughs> the, the incredible says if everybody is special then nobody is but i mean i think there are wines that are art right i think there are wines that are worthy of being called art not ever you know your your yellow tail right that is beverage it's enjoyable making people happy there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but there are wines that are art and I would like to bring people's attention to that by if, if that is by making art in reaction to that art I think that's um that could be the way that I would contribute so I would like to I'd like to see where where it leads me um continuing to sort of be indulged in this in this project of, of really contemplating what wine means for us as individuals, but also as cultures, as society as a whole. So. Well, Sarah, the world is your canvas. Your words, actions, art, tasting skills are your strokes and uh, the paints that you'll use uh, to enlighten, brighten, and really bring to the fore for this generation, current generations, and future generations. Wish you all the best in your endeavors. And thank you for coming on to the Apwazi Wine Buzz. You've been a remarkably uh, great um, uh, guest of ours. And thank you for that. So, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. And I know pleasure. that our paths will pass. And uh, we'll, we'll meet somewhere along, uh, whether it's in, in, in Verona or whether it's mm -hmm. in London or Paris. And I, and I look forward to that time. Thank you, sir. Thank you.